Pastor John here. This week we have another lesson in our series, Lessons for Today from the OT. In this sermon, we hear about Achan, a member of the tribe of Judah who ignored God's directives and stole items devoted to idols and hid them in his tent. The consequences for his actions may seem a little harsh, but they show us something we all need to know about God, something important for us today. So listen in as we ask the question, what will you do when your sin finds you? Hey, before we get to our passage for today, uh, let me just share this with you. Last week, we came to you and, and shared about the ministry that uh, Pastor Ovidio has in Romania to the refugees. Um, for the first time since we've known Ovidio, he asked us for funds. Uh, he was trying to equip his camp uh, to to minister to these people that were going to come across the border. First day he had four, second day he had 33, and then the flood started. He's, he, they've lost count of how many people have gone through his camp. This morning he had 33 seats available. He said they would be filled. Uh, they had a lot of people coming across the border. Uh, middle class folks, folks like us, people that had to pack their car and leave, not knowing where they were going to and not knowing what they were going to do when they got there. And there's a video standing three miles away saying, we've got a bed, we've got blankets, we've got pillows, we've got food for you, we have contacts for you, we can help you along your way. Uh, so we asked for funds. And I'm here today to tell you that we raised over $15,000 in three days. And we had funds come from not just this church, you gave generously, thank you, praise God for that. But we've had funds come all up and down the East Coast from as far away as Australia. So we have been the vehicle that have allowed people to participate in blessing these people that are so desperate for, for food and shelter. So thank you, praise God, and uh, we appreciate you as a congregation. Thank you. We're in Joshua chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 26. While you're finding your way there, I want to tell you about uh, I was a very young teenager 12 going on 13, you know how that works. I just bought this bike, and uh, my, my mom kind of took me aside, and she said, I know what you're going to do. You're going to go places that I don't want you to go, and I'm just sitting there kind of quiet, because I had realized the year before that when my mom couldn't see me, she didn't know what I was doing. So I've got all these ideas in my head, and, and my mom said, the one place I don't want you to go is over this particular side of town. I said, okay, Mom, don't worry. So the next day I'm over the other side of town. And uh, I come home, and my uncle uh, comes up to me, and he says, did I see you on your bike over at that side of town? And I went, no, it wasn't me. He said, you waved at me. <laughs> he said, I'm going to tell your mother. And I can't tell you the fear that struck in my heart. I was afraid. I was so afraid. I didn't know what to do. And I, you know, I didn't sleep for a couple nights waiting for my mom to come and confront me. Well, she never did. <laughs> and I realized a couple years later that my uncle was over on that side of town too. <laughs> so, so, so he couldn't say anything to my mom, but I was afraid. What makes you afraid? You know, we get afraid when we've done something wrong, don't we? When, when we know that we've done something wrong, we thought maybe we'd get away with it, but this is how the enemy works in our lives. He convinces us to do these things, and we do them, and then he says, oh, you should have never done that. What kind of Christian are you? And, 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 and we get afraid that God's going to do something, that, that God's going to confront us, and, and we think that maybe we can hide it. And we're going to talk about Achan today, and Achan thought that he could hide his sin. And the question for the morning is, not just what makes you afraid, but what are you going to do? What will you do when your sin finds you? Think about that. Our, our passage talks about Achan, member of the tribe of Judah, just about the time that Joshua begins leading the Hebrews in and through Canaan, the promised land. And Achan's tragic tale rolls out in four scenes. We see a supplication on behalf of the Hebrew people in verses 6 through 9 of Joshua 7. We see the solution to the problem in verses 10 through 15. 
Then we see a search in verses 16 through 23. And then we see a stoning in verses 24 through 26. So here's, here's the context of what's happening in this passage. Joshua just led the battle of Jericho. It fell miraculously. God's chosen people are given this incredible supernatural victory. And they're celebrating taking down the city. It should be. They're basking in, in the victory of it that God gave them. And then we read this in Joshua 6, 27. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Beautiful. The next verse, which is Joshua 7, 1, we see this. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Now, we see right away that Achan is the problem here. Joshua doesn't know about that yet. He learns about it in a harsh way. He sends troops against this small town called Ai, which is about 12 miles due west of Jericho, just north of Jerusalem in the hill country there. And, and the, the, the battle against Ai should have been an easy victory for God's people. Matter of fact, this guy said, don't send a lot of people, we got this. And, and even though it should have been an easy victory, we find out the Jews end up running from the people of Ai. So that leads us to this anguished prayer, this, this, this supplication that Joshua begins in Joshua 7, verse 6. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel. And they put dust on their heads. These are signs of grief. And Joshua said, listen to this. They, they just got the victory in Jericho. Joshua says, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? to give us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. Oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? So Joshua is distressed. And this prayer arises from Joshua and the elders' assumption of what God is doing. And it's kind of like, well, didn't God promise that they'd be given the promised land? The, the prayer of Joshua and the leaders is based solely on their own interpretation of their circumstances. Their own interpretation of what God is doing in their lives. They see no other alternatives. They see no way out of this. And what they're doing is they are allowing their situation to determine who God is and what he's doing. They seem, seem to have forgotten what God is doing and has been doing among them. I mean, they marched around Jericho seven times on the last day. The walls fell down. The city fell to them. It was absolutely spectacular. Now, now they've suffered a defeat. And they think it's all over. That ever happened to us? God's blessed us, he's blessed us, he's blessed us, he's blessed us. We run into a snag. We hit a hard spot. And we think, we think the rest of our life's going to be that way. We think the rest of eternity is going to be that way. Is it that easy? Is it that easy to forget? the blessings that God gives us. Well, let's see what God has to say about the prayer that Joshua and the elders make. God has a solution. This is our second scene. Other than giving up and going back to the other side of the Jordan, I mean, this has kind of been a habit of the Jewish people ever since they left Egypt. They'd go to Moses and go, why'd you take it from Egypt? We liked all the fruit and nuts there. Why did you take it from Egypt? We had it good. 
They keep on looking back, going back to the good old days. Verse 10, Then the Lord said to Joshua, Get up! Why have you fallen on your face? And there's really a series of questions involved in this. God's saying, what, did, did you think I lied to you? Do, do you think my promises are weak? Or is there any possibility here, Joshua and Israel, that I want to teach you something? What, what might that lesson be? And we find out in, in verse 11, Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. Now, notice the use of the word they. He's talking about the entire nation. Whatever happened here, the whole nation is impacted. God doesn't say if there's any individual guilt here. He doesn't single out one person. Not yet. Not yet. He says that everyone is impacted by sin. And what have they done? They've taken the devoted things. What Devoted to what? Devoted to idols. Now, that's a running theme in Joshua. God keeps on telling his people, don't take devoted things into your home. They'll impact you. They'll cause you to worship those things or those gods rather than God. But despite their warning, they keep on doing it. And that's what just happened here. The second half of verse 11 said, they have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Verse 12, therefore the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Now, the reason for their defeat is sin has crept into the camp. Somebody's done something they weren't supposed to do. And God has turned away from them. And they're saying, oh, it's all over. We've lost. We've messed it up. God has turned away from us. We're now doomed because something's happened here. That's what Joshua and the leaders think. That's what's going through their mind. You can hear it in their prayer. Actually, nothing could be further from the truth. God's not abandoning them. Look what God tells them to do. Verse 13, get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. So literally, what God tells them is you're on the wrong path. You need to change your course. You need to reverse your direction. You need to get rid of those things that cause people to stumble. You need to get rid of those idols in your lives. There's no victory when you have them. In other words, if they allow anything to come between them and God, if they allow anything to interfere with their relationship with God, they're not going to walk in God's blessing. They're not going to experience God's protection. But they can avoid this by doing what God says. And what God is telling them to do is to repent. Repent. He's got some specific instructions, but here we have the core nature of repentance. Changing course. Reversing behavior. Demonstrating a desire to be closer to God than anything else in life. It's more than just being sorry, brothers and sisters. Repentance isn't just saying, oh, I'm sorry I did that. It comes with it a change in behavior, a new behavior, a new focus in life, a new focus that centers upon God and a desire to be closer to Him. So, God gives them this notion of repentance, but He doesn't just leave them hanging there. He knows this is, this is hard for them. He knows they're not quite sure what's going on yet. He doesn't just say, turn around. He guides them and helps them along. Verse 14, in the morning... Therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes, and the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans. And the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households. And the household that the Lord takes shall come near by man. And verse 15, And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire. Whoa. He and all that he has. Because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, 
and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. God gives him a method to atone for this sin, step by step. And they have to administrate it. Some participation is required. God's not going to write all this stuff off. And we find out in these passages that the sin is committed by one person, one singular individual. The solution to the sin of Israel is not only tragic, it's horrific. And it's going to begin with a search. A search of the entire nation is our third scene. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near, tribe by tribe, large groups. The tribe of Judah was taken. Now they're doing this by throwing some bones down on a carpet and trusting that the Lord is going to arrange the bones in such a way that his will is accomplished in this. Verse 17, And he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clans of the Zerahites was taken, And he brought near the clan of the Zerahites, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. You got a picture, Achan, standing over in a corner, getting nervous, a little sweat on his brow. Verse 18, and he brought near his household, man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Oh, man. You ever done something wrong? Realize you're going to get caught? Just waiting for it to happen? (laughs) Waiting for what you've done to be discovered? And you're waiting for that moment, and it is agonizing. Maybe some of you have never done anything wrong and got caught. But I rode my bike on the wrong side of town. (laughs) And Aiken is experiencing this right here in this moment. He's watching everything get whittled down. The elders casting lots. And with each cast, the number of people narrows until they rest on Achan's clan and then on his family and then on him. Verse 19, Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel. Give praise to him and tell me now what you've done. Do not hide it from me. And what Joshua is saying is, honor God in this moment. Yes, you did something bad, but give God the glory by confessing your sin. Admit that you, Achan, are not as holy as God. Admit that you've done something wrong. And in verse 20, and Achan answered Joshua, truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, and 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. Then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. These are all, in particular, the cloaks. These are all dedicated to idols. The search ends with Achan standing there, singled out by God. The lots fall to him. He has no defense. He's one of God's chosen people, charged with bringing blessing to the world. But he sinned. And he's smart enough and godly enough to confess. Now, in our modern day assessment of what's going on here, a lot of us would think that, well, he's a pretty good guy. I mean, he admitted what he did. There shouldn't be too much penalty here. He confessed. He sounds sincere. He's not a bad guy at all. He just kind of had a bad moment and disobeyed God, right? Who could fault him for that? We want to do the same thing if we were in that situation. So, maybe the consequences shouldn't be so bad. I mean, after all, he seems like a good guy. That leads us to, to the stoning. Listen to this, verse 22. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent. And behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel, and they laid them down before the Lord. 
And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, listen, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, and his sons and daughters, whoa, and his oxen and donkeys and sheep, and his tent and all that he had, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Now, this is the valley of of trouble. You don't want to be going to the Valley of Achor. At least if you do, you don't want to spend much time there. Verse 25, And Joshua said, Why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. A little play of words here. You brought this trouble, now the Lord's going to bring trouble back to you. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. Brothers and sisters, God takes sin seriously. There is no casual sin. He warned his people time and again not to bring sin into the camp, that it would stain everything. It's a cancer that goes through his people. And that if they did that, the drastic measures would be taken when it occurred. And here we are, Achan and everything he's come into contact with, even his family, are put to death. Does this sound fair? No, it doesn't. But i got to tell you something. Fairness is a human contrivance. We've made up the concept of fairness. Oh, if you do this, you should get that. If you don't do this, you should, should get this over here. God is not fair. He never says he is. I'll tell you what God is. He's holy. He's absolutely holy. And in his holiness, he is just. And he did to Achan and his family what he promised he would do. When sin arose in his people, God eradicated it. He wiped it out completely. Why? Because he's a cruel father and is trying to be mean to everybody? No, because he's a loving father. He wants his children to draw close to him, but he is holy and sin is unholy and any sin will stand between him and his children. It's not hard on God, it's hard on his children. But because he's holy and just and loving, he provides for his people a way to remove the sin. So we got these four scenes. We have the supplication. Joshua and the elders of Israel allowed their prayers to be shaped by their situation. We all do that. Don't we? We allow our prayers to be shaped by our situation. Perhaps the most difficult prayer any of us will ever pray is, God, thy will be done. Simple prayer. But it's very hard for us to avoid telling God what we'd like him to do. Trusting in the Lord after we pray that prayer is the hard part as well. Knowing that he'll do what he says he will do, sometimes we worry about that. We saw the solution. The solution to the dilemma is not to give up, not to throw in the towel, but to turn around, to move toward God. Instead of a way to move towards him, instead of doubt, we, we need to trust him. That may be difficult, and we may be called upon to do some hard things. We just saw that. But being at peace with God is worth anything we have to do to achieve that peace. We saw the search. And brothers and sisters, if you didn't see anything in the search, know that God is thorough. Achan had nowhere to hide. He had no secrets. Nowhere he could go to avoid God's scrutiny. And the day that Achan stood before his God, he knew there would be a price to pay for blatantly disobeying him. He knew. It wasn't a minor infraction. 
I mean, we've got to think about this. Achan was telling God, listen carefully, Achan was telling God that God had not given him enough, that he needed more, that he deserved more. Achan was not dependent upon God. He was depending upon himself. He was telling God that God's rules were not important to him. Maybe they didn't even apply to him. I'm a special case. God will let me, give me a buy on this. He was saying to God that he, Achan, was wiser and craftier and would carve his own way through life. Hmm. And ironically, that solution that looked so good to him, when he arrived home with his prizes, the guilt hit him. And, and he hid it. He hid it under the carpet. Oh, they'll never find it. Nobody will think of moving this carpet. I'm safe. And because of all that, there was this stoning. Harsh? Yeah, it's harsh. But just as well, Achan brought this stain down on his family and all that he owned because he was contaminated and he contaminated them. There's a life lesson. They all paid the price for Achan's sin. Brothers and sisters, there's no private sin. There's no victimless sin. It stains us and everything around us. And what we find out is your sin will find you. I mean, the sin found Achan, didn't it? My uncle busted me. I knew I was going to have to face my mom. And the hard part about it was there's nobody to stand between me and my mom. So when your sin finds you, who will stand between you and God? Who will mediate? For Achan, there was no one to stand between him and God's wrath. I'll tell you, every week I read an article saying don't talk about God's wrath from the pulpit. It turns people off. Oh, you get saved to heaven. We don't have to talk about God's wrath. You need to know what you're saved from. Here's an example of what you're saved from if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Can you imagine what that was like for Achan? Knowing he had his sin lying under the carpet in the tent, hearing Joshua call the whole camp together, listening to all these names until it landed on him alone. He did the right thing. He confessed. But there are still consequences to pay. The wages of sin are death. Their death, an irrevocable truth of Scripture, the wages of sin are death. Someone had to die, blood had to be shed. But wait, why does the whole family have to suffer? They didn't do anything. God's teaching a different lesson here. We need to be very careful that we don't ascribe truth to, to this that don't necessarily apply. Achan has stained the entire nation. That's why they're defeated at I. There's a manifestation of the sin. Once he identifies and confesses, the nation is absolved. But there's still consequences for Achan. I've been telling you for a long time. There are earthly consequences for our sins, brothers and sisters. We don't get a buy on. There are no eternal consequences for those who know Jesus Christ. But there can be earthly consequences. So Achan and his family are now a potential stain, and God is going to clean up that stain by eliminating Achan and everything he owns, everything. So God eliminates Achan's name. And you know the Jewish interpretation of names, it's everything that represents you. It's your character, your nature. There's no indication here that Achan and his family are condemned to hell for all eternity. We don't see that, but there are worldly consequences. And that's what, that's what God wants to show us in Achan's story. The sin reaches deep into his home and has to be dealt with. For Achan, the consequences fall directly on him, but then they fall on his family. And the terrifying wrath of God descends on these people. And Achan becomes a picture of what it's like to be personally responsible 
for your sin. What happens when judgment falls on you? It's going to be another 2,000 years before God would send His only Son to stand between sin and His children. And that's what Jesus does. He takes on the wrath of God so that we don't have to. So, here's some practical lessons we learned. You know, if you sin, confess. Don't wait. You don't have to worry about stoning today. But we need to trust and depend on the blood of Christ to save us and absolve us, cleanse us of that sin. Another practical lesson. When temptation calls, don't respond. When it beckons to you, wait. Don't act on it. Wait. Now, we know this is good advice because of what happens in the first couple verses of chapter 8 of Joshua. Listen to this. Uh, Now, the sin is washed away. Achan and his family are gone. And Joshua chapter 8, verse 1, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise. Go up to Ai and see I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city, and his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourself. If Achan had waited, he'd just been patient, he could have had everything that he wanted and not have been outside God's will. Now, this is not God being a control freak, brothers and sisters. This is his warning against us not to become control freaks, not to be self-determined, not to set God's word aside and do what we want to do. It may well be that God made this decree before they went to I about taking devoted things just to show Israel not to let the victory of Jericho go to their heads. That when you bask in a victory like that, that it's easy to stray from him. Maybe God wanted to show them and us a lesson about holiness. Why we're reading this so long from so long ago. Those are good practical lessons. But there's a deeper one here. What we learned about God here is he is absolutely, completely holy. I think we underestimate the holiness and purity of God. He will not tolerate sin, none of it, not one bit. And the penalty for sin is unimaginably terrifying. See, Achan's real problem was that he had to endure God's wrath all by himself. It came down on him and his family in terrifying fashion. The only thing that could possibly have saved Achan if there was one who was holy enough to stand between him and God. One who was holy enough to take the punishment for him. For Achan, there's no one. For us here today, there's Jesus Christ. God gives us this picture of Achan to see what can happen to us if there's no Savior, if there's no Redeemer that we talked about a little bit earlier, if there's nobody to absorb the wrath of God, we become Achan. Why? Because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the mark. So we give thanks to God for sending a way for us to be with him instead of being subjects of his terrifying wrath. That gives us reason to be thankful as we prepare our hearts for communion. This is a reminder. It's a reminder of what God's done for us. It's a reminder of the fact that we share that blessing together, that we're unified in that, that we have one Savior, one baptism, one faith. And that's a gift from God. So we're going to hand these out. We'll take them together. Peel the top off. There's a wafer underneath there. Then peel the top off again, and the juice is beneath that. So Jesus took that bread. He blessed it, and he broke it.
And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. Then he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood that is shed for you. Take and drink. Father, we are humbled by the story of Achan and the realization that Achan went through that so that we could have a greater appreciation for your grace. So that we could be more thankful for the sacrifice that was made for us that we might never have to endure your wrath descending upon us the way it did on Achan. That we might never have to endure the greater wrath that descended on your son, Jesus Christ, who was sinless and perfect, unlike Achan, unlike us. But he endured it. He took it on because of your great love for us. Oh, Lord, we give you thanks. Oh, Lord, we give you praise. Oh, Lord, we declare you are holy and just. And we pray this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be back again next week with Gideon. Pastor John back here again. If you are blessed by the service, let me ask you to do us a favor. Click on the like button below, that little thumbs up icon. If you're listening on sermon audio, perhaps you can comment or even share the sermon with someone else. We'd be blessed by that. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter at WBFVA. And we're also on the World Wide Web at WBFVA.org. Let us know if you'd like us to pray for you. If you'd like to support us financially, you can make donations through our website at WBFVA.org. Just click on giving and follow the links from there you'll receive a tax-deductible receipt at the end of the year. Either way, we would love to hear from you or even have you visit us in person one Sunday. We meet at 46 Winchester Street in historic downtown Warrington, Virginia at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning. And now, may God bless you richly until we gather again.